And today we'll continue with our theme of uh, unconditional lower bound. Uh, so from yesterday and today I'm trying to tell us about um, trying to straight off the learning problem. Uh, okay, so I will discuss uh, this line of work um, uh, showing time-space hardness for learning problems. This is a pretty recent line of work, and I will cover some results with uh, Sumega Guard, Gilad Kohl, and Ran Raz, and also some uh, uh, results of, uh, of other people in the last five years or so. Uh, okay, so let me start with the learning model. So this is the streaming model. This was suggested by Shamir and Steinhardt, Valiant, and Wager. And they wanted to capture uh, what can a learner with bounded memory uh, learn efficiently. So you have a learner, and the learner wants to learn some black box F. Think of this as some Boolean function that you only have uh, black box access to. And in fact, you have a much more limited access to. So you get to see just a stream of randomly selected examples. So you get to see randomly selected input here and the output of the, the black box. And then you get to see the next input and output and the next. And the important word here is the word streaming. Okay, so you can go forward in the stream. You cannot go backwards. The, the only way that you can sort of remember things is if you write it in your notebook. And your notebook is so, sort of limited. So you can write on, on top of your notebook, you can erase stuff, write again. The question is, can you efficiently learn the function? Uh, okay, so this is uh, really understanding what can be learned under bounded memory. And what, usually when we talk about learning, this black box F is known to be taken from some class of functions. So it's not like any function is possible, but we know that in advance that the function is taken from a concept class. Uh, and the different concept class define different learning problems. So let me mention a few uh, known examples from the literature. So what if I tell you in advance that the function is a parity function? So how can I uh, characterize the parity function? So for each vector x in 0, 1 to the, to the n, I have a function defined by x that on input a simply takes the inner product of a and x. Okay, which is really the same as the sum over i, a i, x i, right? Modulo two. So now, what, what is your goal when, when you're trying to learn this function? You're sort of given random inputs and outputs to this function, and you want to learn the function, or in other words, you want to learn x. It's equivalent in this case. Okay, so we would talk a lot about party learning in the first part of the talk, and then later we'll see how to generalize the result to other problems. Uh, I want to mention some other uh, classes of uh, concept classes that are interesting for us. So DNF learning is the case where we know that F is a small size DNF formula. We don't know which small size DNF formula it is. We want to figure it out. Uh, we have a stream of examples. In decision tree learning, we know that F is a small size decision tree. In junta learning, we know that F is a junta. What is a junta? It's a function that depends only on L out of the N input bits. We think of L as much smaller than N, but we don't know which input bits are the ones that, that matter. Okay, and so we need to figure this out, and we need to figure how the function depends on these input bits. And as we'll see, the results that I will mention will apply to all these uh, problems. <coughs> okay, so I want to start with this parity learning problem, and to do it, uh, more precisely, and I want to say exactly what we are trying to do. So x, this vector x, or this string in 0, 1 to the n, <coughs> defines the function is, and is unknown to the learner. The learner wants to, to know x eventually. And how the learner tries to learn x is given the stream of examples, a1, b1, a2, b2, etc., where each a, i, is drawn uniformly at random from all possible strings of length n. And each bi is simply the inner product of ai with x. After seeing this stream of examples, the learner needs to, to learn x or output x with high probability. We can also talk about weak learning, where we are trying to output like a, an hypothesis that is somewhat close to the, the true hypothesis. 
In this case, and in the models, we're going to consider the two are equivalent. So once you have a weak learner, you also have a learner. So let's just focus on that. Uh, OK, so this is usually when we talk about learning, it's like with respect to worst case on the, the function. So it is with respect to worst case over x, <coughs> we can actually relax it and consider it in the average case. So let's say that x is chosen uniformly at random in the beginning. And we just, uh, and then we do everything as before. Then actually, the lower bounds that we will show is under this model, which, which are, which are stronger lower bounds. Okay. So before talking about the lower bounds, let's figure out first what are the upper bounds. How can we actually <coughs> learn parity? Okay. So how can you learn x from this uh, stream of random samples? So the first algorithm that comes to mind is Gaussian elimination, right? So each uh, uh, sample that you get gives you a linear equation on the unknown variable x1 up to xn, right? So, so you know that the linear equation is that x in a product with a equals some b. Once you store a order n of this linear equation, with high probability, the rank would be full. And then you can just do Gaussian elimination and figure out what x was. So this very simple uh, algorithm takes you order n samples. And to store them, you need order n squared memory bits. Then you do the Gaussian elimination. Maybe the time is uh, n to the omega, but we will not worry about time. We will worry about the amount of memory bits and the number of samples. So these are the two complexity measures that we will care about. Okay, so this looks pretty efficient, at least in terms of samples, it's actually optimal, right? Because we did test n samples to get enough information about x. But we can ask, maybe we can improve the memory. <coughs> and in fact, you can. You can, you can learn this with uh, only linear memory, <coughs> but this requires exponential uh, time. And what is this algorithm? So there are actually two variants of this algorithm. So I will just describe, the, let's describe the first one. So I'm going to go over all possible x's. So I have 2 to the n of them. I will store my current guess for x. And I will check if my current guess is consistent with, let's say, the next n squared samples. OK? So for each uh, iteration, whenever I'm trying to check x, I'm drawing fresh samples, maybe n squared of them. So we'd have 2 to the n times n squared samples. However, the amount of memory that I require is just to store x and to store a counter. So n plus order log n. So really, I can, I can. Why don't n squared and not n? Ah, uh, just, yeah. OK. Actually, you can do it in 2 to the n. You can like. Oh, OK. Like the wrong x would, uh, on expectation, after like a constant number of attempts would uh, Oh, okay. I'm very fine. But yeah, just want to be on the safe side. OK. <coughs> Another uh, algorithm here is just to, to wait until you see uh, the standard basis. This would also take you to the end time and would require you uh, just to store the uh, valuation on the standard basis, which is n bits. Okay, so these are the two algorithms. And you can ask yourself, well, these two algorithms are pretty simple. Uh, one of them has very good dependence on the number of samples, but quadratic mem memory. The other has linear memory, but exponential samples. Can we trade off between the two? Can we maybe get something better if we allow, I don't know, n to the 1.5 uh, memory bits? And the surprising answer is that, that we cannot. Okay, so, so so maybe the word tra trade-off is problematic because there is no trade-off in this case. Uh, there's just a lower bound. So one rises breakthrough shows that if your algorithm uses less than n squared memory bits, then it requires to have an exponential number of samples. Okay, so basically, what, what does this theorem tell us? You have these two algorithms, and there's nothing more than that. Exponential is to the above n? Yeah. To the omega n, and it even works when the amount of memory bits is smaller than n squared over 10. So it's like pretty good constant. 
We don't know exactly what is the right constant. We know that you can do it in n squared over four memory bits. Uh, and the first part of the talk will be mainly about uh, how this proof is, go uh, is going on. Uh, but before going into the proof, I want to uh, mention the, uh, our other work with Gilat, Cole, and Ran Raz, where we focused on a subcase of disparity learning. We are interested in understanding what happens if we know in advance that the vector x is sparse. Okay, so let's say that the vector x has L1s and all the rest are zeros. And think of L as much smaller than n, maybe log n. Okay, so, so this gives us a lot of information about x initially, and then we need to figure out x after seeing the examples. So why do we care about this special case? So it's, ver it's a very natural special case. Many people came up with this as an open question after seeing the, the result of run. But moreover, if L equals log n, okay, so if we look, we look at the sparsity log n case, it's also a special case of linear size DNFs, linear size decision trees, and juntas on log n variables. <coughs> you can see this, this is pretty simple. So once you have sparsity L, the input bits that you depend on are only the one where xi equals 1. Right? The one where xi equals 0 like, doesn't affect the output of the, the function. Right. Here. Uh, so really, when the, the parity is L sparse, you only depend on L variables, so you are junta on L variables. Any junta on L variables can be described as a decision tree of depth L, or size exponentially in L. So that's why you get this thing. And any decision tree can be described as a DNF formula of similar size. So, so that's why you get all these results, all these connections. So what does it mean? It means that if you want to learn DNF formulas, you must also learn sparse parities. Or in other words, if you have a lower bound for sparse parities, you have lower bounds for all these uh, other tasks. Again, this is uh, something that I will mention. So this was the motivation for us. And then, OK, again, you need to understand the upper bounds, what, what is possible. So we know a lot about the, the vector x. We know that it's sparse. So again, we can uh, sort of adapt the algorithms from, from before, the general case. So the one, one of them was just going over all possible x's and try, trying to verify that we get the right x. So this would be uh, very similar to what we had before, but now the number of possible x's is n choose l. Okay. And again, I, I, I've been very cautious here, and I required uh, to check if this is consistent with the next n squared uh, equations. You can do it done better. How much memory it requires you to store the current guess for x? Well, you just need to store L indices. So it's log n choose L, or at most L times log n. Right? So, so the memory is really good here. It's even sublinear. The number of samples is not so good, right? So if L equals log n, it's super polynomial. It's n to the log n. So you can ask, maybe you can find something better in terms of number of samples. So you can try to do something similar to Gaussian elimination. Okay, there will be a small twist here. So I'm going to record something like L times log n equations in my memory. And then I'm going to check which x is consistent with this set of equations. So this thing is not efficient, efficient in terms of time, but we don't care about time. We care only about samples and the amount of memory. Okay, so, and why would this work even, okay? So think of x, how much uh, entropy do you have on x? You have at most L times log n entropy in x. And each equation gives you one bit of information, roughly. So this is enough to, to identify the correct uh, vector. Isn't this just the compressed sensing? Uh, is exactly the, uh, the problem that's solving compressed sensing? Anyway, Maybe. Yeah. Not I'm not familiar with that. So. Well, sir, isn't but that only over the real numbers? Yeah. I don't know it's, that it's you can like do that. In, it's, you. it's in a different community. There's an analog over the over over you know uh, integers over 
But it, anyway, but it, it's that argument. I think more, more general, this is just Occam's razor. Right, right. That right. Was, yeah. Yes, this is sort of like, yeah, this is like Occam's razor that you, you can always do it with order log of this number of functions. Uh, this is still not an, alg an efficient algorithm, so it will be interesting. Maybe we can say something about uh, time complexity, not only sample complexity. Okay, so what is the sample complexity and what is the uh, memory complexity here? So the sample is, is like L times log n, like super efficient, the optimal thing that you can do. Uh, the memory complexity is n times L times log n, right? Because for each equation we need to store it, which requires us n bits. Uh, so this is super linear, and this is what I want to emphasize here. So we got here a uh, very good memory and super polynomial number of samples. Here we got very good number of samples, but super linear memory. We were very tempted to, to, to conjecture, and we even had a proof at one point, but we had a bug, uh, that these are the only two algorithms, as in the uh, case uh, of learning general parities. Uh, maybe if you have less than uh, this amount of memory, then you require this amount of samples or something like that. This is not true, actually. So in, in the sparse case, there is a trade-off. You can find other, al other algorithms. Yes? So couldn't you like, divide the bit positions into about like, L squared random blocks? And you think of like summing up the bits in each block. And because you have, you know, um, more than the uh, birthday paradox number of blocks, you expect each x i each a, x a, i that's one to go into separate block. Um, and yes. So if you sort of you get the or of the x i's in that block. Yeah. So it, it sounds like, similar to the, the algorithms that we f we found. Uh, yeah. So so there is a trade-off uh, because of the sparsity. You can somehow uh, save. Um, yeah, something along the lines that Russell suggested works. Um, okay, so, 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 so once we realize the algorithm, we realize the bug in the proof, and we, we try to fix it. Okay, so, uh, so you c if you are insist on linear memory, we could find an algorithm that runs in L to the L number of samples. And then we ask yourself, you know, we found this algorithm, maybe there are others. And in particular, we were interested in the case of L equals log n. Uh, can you do it with linear memory and polynomial number of samples? Okay, so this is what we consider as efficient. And the answer that, that, that we gave is that this is impossible. Okay, in fact, if you insist on linear memory, this algorithm is more or less tight. Okay, so for learning sparse parities, you need at least n times L to 0.99 memory, or at least L to the L number of samples. So if your memory is smaller than that, then you need at least that number of samples. Okay, so up at least in this, in this sense, if you're only interested in like linear size memory algorithms, then this thing is optimal. So you get L to the omega order L upper bound, you have L to the omega L lower bound. And what, what is this L to the L? It's like log n to the log n. So it's, super, it's actually super polynomial, right? It's like something like n to the log log n. OK, so in other words, what, what did we get? We get that the logs, log n sparse case cannot be learned in linear memory and, uh, and, and the polynomial number of samples. So you, you either need this to be, the memory to be super linear or the number of samples to be super polynomial. And in particular, we get it uh, for all these DNF and decision trees and juntas. Okay, so because this is a special case. Okay, any questions? So so yeah. uh, this is true probably for any L up to. Maybe this is true for all Ls, I don't remember. Maybe it's true only for L up to n to the 0.99. And we have actually, the, the expression here is more complicated, so like you could sort of uh, play with it more. So you can er even have here like n times L, but then this would be 2 to the L. But I don't want to say 2 to the L because 2 to the L is polynomial when L equals 
log n. So you need to like you have some balancing of this problem. It's actually a curve. Yeah. And what's the runtime of your algorithm number three? Uh, yeah, it's not um, it's not an efficient. Uh, What I can recall now. Uh, yes. what, is the, what is the assumption on L for the algorithm? For the algorithm? Yeah. Uh, there's no. Uh, uh, you need to know L in advance. Uh, but what, it, what happens if L is a constant? You know, I have constant samples, but you need to learn at least log n. Uh, yeah, so maybe there are like uh, additional uh, factors, uh, like maybe for it times. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe times log n, but I don't remember. I, I could check it, but I uh, don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, if you think of L as like it's something, at least like log n over log log n. for learning like DNFs or, or decision trees, which satisfy the lower bound but are better than algorithm trees. <coughs> you know what I mean? Uh, that are better. Yeah. So it, they cannot be better, right? Well, no, no, satisfy the lower bound, but there, but there seems to be like, so like, for like, it's like there's space in the middle, right, for like say learning a, a log in size uh, DNF or like a, or like any. Right. Yeah. So, Okay, so it's a very good point. This is one of the open questions that I want to answer. So, uh, in the case of sparse parities, it seems that our upper bounds match the lower bounds. In case of uh, DNF learning or decision tree learning or Kultan learning, the lower bound is this thing. Okay, so it's the same lower bound, but the upper bound is is not matching. So we don't know how to use. Uh, we don't know how to, to take this algorithm and make it into algorithm in this case. And the upper bound is something trivial, like maybe n squared memory bits. So there is, there is a huge gap between the lower bound, which is only slightly super linear, and the upper bound on the memory, which is quadratic. So this would be interesting to close this gap and to understand this better. Okay. I want to, before going into the proof, I want to mention uh, some of the motivations for, for this uh, motivation and application of this uh, result. So, okay, so we start with the motivation of learning, so I, I would not uh, repeat it. Uh, another motivation comes from cryptography. This, the application is to bounded storage cryptography. So based on this result, you can uh, come up with a very simple scheme that allows you, Alice and, that allows Alice and Bob to uh, encode, uh, to, to encrypt and decrypt messages. They need to uh, share a key of length n, which would be simply x, okay, so that's what we get before. And then whenever Alice wants to send a message to Bob, she would sort of draw a random a, uh, take the inner product of a and x and get from it a random looking bit and xor it to her message. So we would uh, require something like n steps per bit, and this would be secure against uh, attackers that have less than n squared memory bits. So I want to, to, do, to do it a little bit slowly. So we have Alice and Bob. And they draw x uniformly at random from 0, 1 to the n. And this is their key. Okay. And the, the attacker doesn't know x. Now whenever Alice wants to send some message m, think of a message as just one bit, she draws a uniformly at random from 0, 1 to the n. She computes the inner product of A. Okay, so the inner product of A with x, and then she sends A and m x or b. Okay. Now she wants to send a new message m prime. She does the same thing. She draws a, a prime, she computes B prime, and she sends A prime and M prime XOR. So if an attacker that just listened to this conversation can learn X, 
right? So he solves the, the problem of parity learning because he get, just gets to see like inputs and outputs to this uh, parity function. And he says that this is impossible. So if, if the attacker has less than n squared bits of memory, it cannot learn x, it cannot um, know the secret key. He cannot even predict, let's say, um, or decrypt the next uh, the next message. So the attacker's memory is at most n squared, or n time is at most to the n. Uh, yeah. So if the, so, basically, we can repeat this, right? So the, so each time we are doing it, we are sending one equation. So we can repeat it at most uh, exponentially number of times, and then we need to maybe exchange a new key. But I guess that we will not reach this point. Um, so the attacker uh, cannot retrieve the key, but is the scheme secure according to like, cryptography's definition of the key? So, so as, I mentioned, as I mentioned, uh, the attacker is, cannot even weak learn mm -hmm. uh, the function, so it cannot even like sort of uh, uh, decrypt with uh, probability better than, let's say, half plus epsilon. So, so this is even stronger than just. Is it pseudo-randomness? I mean, can you just look at the sequence and claim that they, it is? Yeah, it's pseudo-random uh, uh, for this. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay. So, so it's some, it's it's an encryption scheme that uh, like, if you think that there is a gap between the power. Like if you can do something in time n, then the attacker needs to have n squared the amount of resources. So in some sense, when, when technology grows, and uh, this scheme also works. Uh, but the, the, the drawback in this scheme is that you need to perform n operations per uh, bit that you want to send. Uh, OK. So what, what do we get from this sparse case? So we get something uh, a little bit weird. We can decrease the key length actually to L. The the time is still n, and the the scheme is con is uh, unconditionally secure against uh, attackers with memory less than n, n, n times L, uh, as long as the number of samples is less than let's say L to the L. Uh, so this is a bit weird because uh, I mean the problem was not the key length; it was the fact that we invest a lot of time. So. So we want to, to fix that. So actually, in the second part of the talk, we will see that we can do that. We can do, take the key length to be n and the time to be L and to be secure against the same uh, guarantees. OK, so and then you can just think of L maybe as like a really large constant. And then you will be secure against the uh, reasonably uh, large memory. So another motivation comes from complexity. So time space lower bounds or time space trade-offs were studied in complexity a lot. This is just a partial list of, of, of these works. Uh, the main difference in this work and the reason that it can get like a quadratic uh, lower bound on the memory is that the model here is different. A bit. It's, um, the online model is sort of a weaker model of accessing the input because we are accessing it as if it were a stream. So we can only like do a one pass on the input. And instead of just going back and forth, which allows us to do more. Uh, so I will not get into this too much, but uh, I think that Ryan will speak about some of these results in his course on Monday. So I'll be very interested to, to hear more about that. OK, so now we want to formally define the model and go to the proof to see how the proof goes. So we are going to model this uh, bounded memory uh, learner as a branching program. This is uh, the non-uniform way of capturing bounded space computation. What is a branching program? It's a layered graph. Each layer represents a time step of the, of the algorithm or of the learner. And in each layer, all these vertices represent all the possible memory configurations that the learner could have. What do we have? For each non-leaf, we have edges corresponding to how do we update the memory given the next 
sample. Okay, so we would have two to the n plus one outgoing gauges out of each vertex. One corresponding to each possible a comma b. Okay, so remember that a was a string in zero, one to the n, and b was just a bit. So you can think of just the parity learning problem for now. Later we would uh, generalize it to other problems. <coughs> okay. Once we draw this, the sequence or, or the stream of examples, this selects a sequence of edges in this, in this uh, branching program, which we call the computational path. Okay, so simply follow this path until we reach a vertex in the last layer, or a leaf. And what do we want to, to do when we reach to the last vertex? We want to output our guess for x. So each vertex v in the last layer would have a, a guess for the, the value of x. So we'd have a vector x tilde of v, the guess for the value of x. And the program will be successful if x equals x tilde of v. OK, so the, the program needs to learn yeah. x. And as I said, you can also relax this and talk about weak learning. But for this problem, and in this model, the two are equivalent. So once you get a, a function that agrees with your parity function on, let's say, 90% of the input, you can sort of like decode and find like the closest parity function. And this is maybe not time efficient, but we are not talking about time. We are talking about space and samples. So, so these two are equivalent. Okay. And now I want to mention a slightly non-standard model. This is a model that Ron introduced to solve this uh, problem. This is a model called Affine Branching Program. And I'm sorry for the collision with ABP that was in, uh, mentioned there previously in this uh, bootcamp. So an Affine Branching Program is a branching program with additional properties. So you have the same, the same structure as before, but now each vertex V remembers a system of linear equations. Okay, so for each vertex we would, we would associate a system of linear equations. You can think of them as like what the learner remembers about x. And what we would want of this system of linear equations, we would want them to be sound. We would want that if uh, v is reached by the computational path, and you have these equations on v, then the true unknown x would satisfy all the equations. So we don't want to just write equations that, that uh, we made up. We, we sort of uh, only want to store equations that we saw, or maybe linear combination of equations that we saw. OK, so this is the soundness property. But just to satisfy this, it's pretty simple, right? Do, do you see how can you satisfy this uh, property? You can remember every equation that you you know, each sample gives you an equation. Or you can have the empty set of equations. Right, OK. So the first thing is not clear that actually you can do it for this program. But the second thing that you mentioned is true for all programs. You can just say that, well, you remember nothing. And this satisfies the soundness, right? Every, every vertex that you reach satisfies this equation. So, the, so this, um, uh, this redundant case, we want to somehow avoid it. So we need a definition that would say, that the equations that we remember actually capture our knowledge on x. OK, so we are capturing by this notion of accurate affine branching programs. What are these things? So look at these random variables that describe the vertex reached by the computational path on the i-th layer. OK, so this is a random variable. In, in, in what uh, randomness it depends? It depends on the randomness of x and on the randomness of the first i samples. OK, so this is uh, this random variable. We can look at the distribution of x, the condition on the event that we reach a specific vertex v. So we will look at a specific vertex v and look at the distribution of x. So this gives us a distribution of our strings of length n. We would say that an, an affine branching program is accurate if, for every vertex v, this distribution is close to being the uniform distribution over all the solutions to the equations. So basically, 
the previous solution would not work. So we said that we can associate the empty set. This is, does not work because in some cases we remember something on X. And this would not be captured by the, the empty set. So, so this really tells us that whatever we remembered about X is a set of linear equations. So, so this is a more restricted model of computation. It's not clear that, a, that you can sort of convert a branching program to this model. It, this is actually the hard part in the proof. How do you measure distance? Yeah, statistical distance. Um, So, so what will be the proof plan? We will start with a branching program that doesn't necessarily have this property that it remembers just equation. It could remember anything. And then we'll convert it or simulate it using an affine branching program. To go from the branching program to the affine thing, we would need to introduce new nodes and sort of like increase the width. But we will do it in a controlled way. So we will increase the width, but not by too much. Then in the second step, we will prove that if you have an affine branching program that solves this parity learning pro problem, then it requires to be either very wide or very long. Wide corresponds to having a lot of memory. Long corresponds to seeing a lot of samples. OK? So this is our proof plan. Um, so the first step is, is the, the, the trickier one. Uh, the second step is, is a, bit, a little bit simpler. And then in the second part of the talk, we would see how to generalize it to other domains. And then the, we would not have this two-step two plan. We would only have the second step. OK. So I want to uh, be a bit more precise. So this is very high level. It's this uh, simulation and then the lower bound. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make some choice. So instead, in the affine branching program that I'm going to produce, I would uh, have some, some threshold k. You should think of this k as roughly the sparsity of the, par of the sparse parties, or like linear in n in the case of general parties. And we will store up to k equations in each vertex. What do we do if we see more than k equations, or if we get to k equations? Then I Whenever the learner re, uh, remembers k equations on the input, I declare that it wins. I declare that it succeeds in learning. And we will show low bounds even under this more relaxed notion of success. You can see that this is essential. Like, in order to, to, to learn x, you must learn <coughs> at least something like L equations on x, like in the affine case. Otherwise, you have simply too many possibilities what is the correct value, and you cannot guess it. Uh, and also, in the, in the general case, you need at least something like order n equations in order to just have some certainty on the value of x. And I think that there is some intuition behind this uh, setting. So if you think of like the Gaussian elimination algorithm, uh, when does the memory really blow up? So when you store one equation, you just store n bits. When you store two, you store something like two n bits. When you store k, you store k n bits. But then you realize that you can save a little bit because you can sort of uh, perform the Gaussian elimination on a k by k sub matrix. So you're storing something like k n minus k squared bits after seeing k equations. When you reach n, you just need to store the so sort of the diagonal, right? So like you perform the Gaussian elimination. So you don't. So in the end, so you go from n, something like, I don't know, 2n minus 4. In the end, you, you reach to n again. But in the middle, you have something like constant, maybe n, n squared over 4. So when you perform this, when you save these equations, it's the, the, the point in time where your memory explodes is actually when you remember something like n over 2 equations, or a constant number of equations. And this is what we will try to capture here. We'll try to say that this is a bottleneck. OK. So let's return to this proof plan. We want to simulate. We want to take a branching program and convert it into an affine branching program. 
how are we going to do it? So we, we are giving this program. It doesn't have um, uh, the system of linear equations. So we're going to convert it layer by layer. So let's convert the first layer. This is simple. We don't know nothing about x. We can put the empty, the empty set here. We convert the second layer. For this vertex, it's also simple. We just remember this equation, right? So we can put here. We can say that here we only remember this equation. Let's try to convert this layer. Here we, we, we see a problem. Why? If we got to this vertex from this path, we remember two equations. However, if we got here from this path, we remembered a different set of two equations. So it's not clear that we can actually associate it with this vertex, like a system of linear equations that really capture our knowledge. Our knowledge is really that we either arrive from here or from here. And it's like a set of different equations. So in this case, we would not be actually able to to resolve this, and the way that we resolve this is we simply introduce two vertices. So we will split this vertex into two vertices. Okay, so in general, when we convert the i layer, we would look at all the, all the vertices in this layer. Uh, we would look at each vertex and we would split it into several vertices. When we are doing this splitting, we would take all the incoming edges we will partition them into large groups. For each group associated a vertex and a set of accurate linear equations. And we do it step by step, and if we do it correctly, then eventually we get an affine branching program. But the number of you split into fewer edges and the income, fewer groups and the income edges, otherwise you don't... Yes, yeah, of course. So I'm, if I will just take every edge and associate with the vertex, after, uh, like... Uh, seeing n samples in my memory would already be unsquared, no matter how I started with. So I want to control it. I want to uh, make the, the width not uh, increase by too much. Yeah, so, so I would want to, to argue that uh, like I'm splitting each one to, yeah, the, the real parameters that I get is that I'm splitting each one to something like two to the order of k squared. This is actually what we do. Independent of how many? Not independent of how many. It is the end degree of this. Yeah. And don't uh, try to think of K as one. So maybe like polyam. But after uh, T iterations, this number is like two to the T. No, so it, w it doesn't go up. It doesn't matter how many edges you have coming in. Each vertex would be split into these many vertices. Each vertex of this layer, I see. Yeah. So the previous layer might have been split many times, but the next layer will still have the same width. Yeah. And now, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so how do we do this uh, regrouping? This is uh, really the heart of the, of the uh, proof. So let's say that we converted everything up to layer i minus 1. So for each of these vertices, we have a, s a set of linear equations that accurately capture our knowledge on x, given that we reach to this vertex u. And now we have all these edges going into this one vertex. So what we want to do is we want to regroup them. So we want to find a large fraction of them, such that we can associate with them a new vertex and system of linear equations. Then another large fraction, with another system of linear equations, and another one. How do we do that? So what is the situation that we are at? So recall that we want the condition reaching V would be close to all possible solutions to a system of linear equations. We know it for, con uh, for each of the incoming uh, vertices. And I claim that we also know it for the edges. So let's say that I condition on the fact that I pass through this edge. What do I know about x? I know that it satisfies the equation in u. I know that it satisfies the equation on the edge. So I know that it satisfies this system of equation, like LU union, the equation on the edge. But other than that, it's completely uniform. OK? I'm, I'm, I'm adding some details under the rug. So I'm assuming that everything so far was completely accurate. 
like with no error at all. When you say it is completely uniform, you were saying the X is completely uniform condition on this. Con yeah, condition on passing through this edge, X is, is completely uniform over all solution to this system of equations. Okay, our main lemma would be that there is a dichotomy. If there, there exists an equation that is shared by a lot of these edges. So each edge has its own system of equations. If we have an, an equation that appears in many of them, it's, it's a good uh, thing for the regrouping. Why? We would just focus on these edges that share the equation, and now we have one equation that we know that, that is satisfied. And then we will try to find other equations by recursion until we sort of like figure out uh, a, a nice description uh, of our knowledge on, on X. So by share, by you, you mean like in the span of Yeah, the yeah, yeah. So, so the, all of them have this equation in their span. Yes, exactly. So let's say that the first bullet didn't happen. Maybe each one of them has like a different equation. Like, uh, so the first gives you like a subspace like this, the second a subspace like this, the third a subspace like this. So this could be a situation. Well, I claim that this situation, since all of them go to the same vertex, you really don't remember nothing about x. So you're like a convex combination of these subspaces that do not have anything in common to one another. So basically, what you did here, like what the branching problem did here, is forget everything. And then it's, it's simple to associate with this uh, vertex uh, an accurate system of equation. You would simply associate with it the empty set. So, so if we have this dichotomy, <coughs> we sort of understand what, what we are going to do. OK, so, so I want to, to try to prove this. Um, but before that, let's see how does this imply the the regrouping. OK, so once you have this, you sort of uh, look at this dichotomy. If you're in step one, you find this, uh, an equation, and you sort of just focus on these edges, and you repeat only on this system set of uh, edges. And then you maybe find another equation, another equation, until at some point you don't find any equation. In this point, you are close to being uniform over like uh, all possible solution to the equations that you uh, stored so far. And then you can associate it, uh, a vertex and a system of equation, this system of equation. OK, so this gives you like a, a pretty big group of, of uh, edges that, that you can uh, sort of uh, uh, associate with it, the vertex and the system of equation. How do you do the rest? You just repeat on the remaining. Okay, so you repeat. You do it enough times so that you cover like most of the uh, probability mass. So, so when you stop, so, so either it's because you found k equations, and if you have k equations, you somehow say, yeah. <laughs> so if you call it success. What does success mean? So if the if the ABP remembers k equations on x, then I declare that it's successful. Sense it has learned x? Yeah. Okay. It learned something on x, and I, I, f I think of it as something uh, that I'm, uh, I, I consider as a success. And in other cases, you stop because after collecting some k prime equations, on the remaining thing, you have <coughs> uniformity. Right. Exactly. And each time, like the fraction of uh, probability mass at, or the fraction of edges that I'm, I'm going to regroup is something like 2 to the minus k squared of the total number of edges. And if I repeat it something like this many times, I'm covering the, uh, the probability mass well enough. So, so this is uh, uh, main, When you say many of the edges, that's 2 to the minus k squared. Okay, fraction, yeah. So poly n is poly of the length? Uh, uh, yeah, so n, right, so n is uh, this uh, length of, of, of a single uh, vector. No, so, and just, is it, the, the, you need it for a union bound, it's the length of the program eventually? No. Uh, it's, it's log the length of the program. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Juan, are you weighting the, the, the edges by the probability of yeah. the edges? Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. So, um, 
can know are the are the are things going to a unique vertex in the graph, or so like are these vector spaces? So I guess things are still going. Each input goes to a unique place in this yeah. vertex in this graph, defined by the results of the equation. Yeah. Right? So um, so these must the incoming edges must be nearly destroying the 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 affine subspaces. Uh. Why, why disjoint? Actually, it would be nice if all of them have the same alpha and subspace, then like, I would uh, associate well, with how, how could that be? Because every vertex I don't, goes yeah. to a different... I'm not sure, but... Uh, every, every x goes to a different vertex. Yeah. So, um, and if the affine spaces are, are roughly... You know, if, the num if the set of... If the distribution on x's that go to a certain vertex is roughly uniform in the affine subspace, how could the affine subspaces intersect? Because the sets that the effects that they go to those so that's, uh, I think there's some information that's, maybe it's good to go back because I'm also yeah. a little confused, but there was some information about things that were being forgotten here. Right. Branching yeah. is happening on more than just X. So remember that we, the, the pro, also the random process also involves the A's, right? So like maybe I got like an equation and then conditions that I reach this, uh, this vertex, I, I actually learned that this equation holds on x. Maybe if I get got from a different vertex, I know that another equation holds on x. So it yeah. doesn't necessarily describe different x's uh, because it corresponds to different randomness of the stream of samples. Seems like the definition of accurate with respect to something. Yes, so. Uh, oh, oh, I see. Yeah, I mean, in, okay. intuitively, a node should, that doesn't know very much about x, should, the, this conditional distribution should be, uh, um, yeah, very little information uh, kept accumulated. Okay. No, I, I forgot that the, there's also branching on the samples, you see. Okay, okay. <coughs> okay so this is a random variable that describes uh, uh, the vertex. Uh, in the computation path. It's the I. And we strictly <coughs> looked at this thing. The condition on probability of an X condition on reaching a specific vertex. But we call that this random variable also depends on the samples. It depends on. A1 up to AI. In particular, I'll just look at, like, let's say that I have this, this uh, look at two layers. So in the first layer, I'm just storing the equation. And then, let's say in the second layer, I'm forgetting everything. So then I'm like taking, like, this is subs each, each of them has a subspace, but they are, they are not disjoint. And, uh, this would fall into the second uh, part of the dichotomy. Okay. Maybe, maybe I'm learning, like I remember two equations, and then I could get to the same thing, but if I see like this equation first and this equation second, here I would see it in different order. So then I can all, I get like the same subspace twice. So. So, so there are uh, very simple cases arise even in yeah, two layers. Okay, so maybe it will be a good time to take a break because I want to go to the whiteboard and, and uh, prove this main lemma. Uh, so let's so let's take a break and uh, return.